We are sticking with this theme now, and I'm delighted to say that Matt Williams is with us. Good morning, Matt. Good morning, Alan. Nice to talk to you, Matt. Yeah, you too. So, Ulster versus Leinster this weekend, we kind of led with Munster and Leinster yesterday, so we're going to flip things around today and start with Ulster. Uh, Dan McFarland saying yesterday that they've got a puncher's chance this weekend. Is that about an accurate summation of where they're at going into this game? I, I think they've got more than um, what Dan's suggesting. He's obviously playing his cards close to his chest. Um, but I'll still have a, have a pretty good record uh, against uh, Leinster. And probably because of what Keith, we just heard Keith Wood saying there, I'll still don't come down to, to, to Dublin and rope a dope. You can't rope a dope, Leinster. You can't sit back and do what Munster did and think we're going to box kick a team into submission. Just... Leinster, you can't beat Leinster that way. When Leinster lose, teams have got to throw a lot of punches. And Ulster almost did it last year in that Champions Cup game that, that we all remember where if, if uh, the ball was put down correctly uh, over the line by Jacob Stockdale, and I'm sure you'll never forget it, uh, Ulster probably would have won that game. So, and, and they came down on, uh, in December last year and there was that wonderful game at the RDS, you know, 50-odd points to Leinster and 45 and a bit or something to, to Ulster. You know, they were very, very close. Ulster will not die wondering what if. They'll, they'll get all the dance out in the music. And that makes them... That, that Leinster don't like that. That makes mm. them uncomfortable. And so they got, they got a good shot. Not, not, not favourites, but they've got a good shot. When you're watching this game from a coaching perspective, Matt, and you're looking at Ulster over the last few weeks, how clear is their attacking identity? Do you look at them and say, all right, that makes sense? Uh, even if I didn't know this was Ulster, I could tell this is a Dan McFarland coach team. It's a really, a really good question because I've been really impressed with what Dan has done with Ulster. They've, they've played some really exciting rugby and they're giving everything to the jersey. And that's something that a few years ago we couldn't say about Ulster signs. They just, they just didn't seem to be putting in. And my um, fading contacts north of the border were saying it wasn't a happy camp and that a lot of people that were wearing the jersey you know, didn't really appreciate the history and the value of it. But that's turned around now. But since COVID, they, they really haven't played like they had played beforehand. Very disappointing against Connacht. Hugely courageous last week. Hugely courageous. But again, probably didn't play... It, it was a dramatic game, but probably didn't play like they have done before. Whereas Leinster have played some very good rugby uh, in the games since we've come back, where Ulster haven't. So... Um, and, and that's not a criticism. It's more an observation, because this is really hard. What, what's occurred this season is, is, you know, again, that word unprecedented. No rugby teams have had to do this. So maybe this is a week where Ulster can come out and, and, and show what a Dan McFarlane side looks like. Now, last week, what we saw from a Dan McFarlane side was, one, they won't quit. Two, they'll fight to the last second of the game. And three, they just never know that they should be beaten. They were beaten in that game for all money and they refuse to be beaten. Now, teams like that, that will also come out and run are really dangerous. But we haven't seen the fluid attacking play that uh, we saw at, at times last year. And, and the absolutely desperate defence that Ulster put in in some of those great uh, Heineken Cup games up at, uh, up at Raven Hill there, when the, their defence was just inspirational. So, you know, I think we'll see the courage, we'll see the commitment, but I'm not sure. We've got no evidence, let's put it that way. Uh, we've got no evidence to say that they're back to their, uh, the full um, throttle that they were showing uh, pre-COVID. Uh, Matt, you mentioned the, the refusal to be beaten there from Ulster and, and, you know, two scores down, facing another knockout defeat. I think they've lost six of their most recent uh, seven knockout games. Uh, were you impressed by, by their mental resilience, their refusal to give up? And, and, and uh, do Ulster look a little bit more mentally strong going into this final than they have in previous years going into big games with Leinster? Yeah, they, they certainly um, have shown in the last 12 months, especially in the Heineken Cup, that they've got some deep resolve back within their organisation. And that resolve has been very, very hard to find in recent times. Uh, probably since their, their um, final, when they reached the Heineken Cup final against Leinster a number of years ago, almost a decade ago, you know, they, they, 
they haven't really shown that same fight that is what or was historically associated with Ulster teams. But they, they have they have shown that in recent times. And uh, they've got a really hard uh, road. They've got Leinster away and then they've got Toulouse away. I mean, wow. It's just, you, unless you're playing Saracens away, it doesn't come much harder than that. I think, I think Toulouse in Toulouse still remains probably the most difficult uh, French fixture to take on, probably I'd, I'd still say that's even harder than taking on Racing in Paris. So they've got a they've got a really tough ten days on their hands. But I think this is the one where that they'll feel they've got a shot at, because Leinster are also chasing two rabbits. The old story: you chase two rabbits, you end up with none. And I'm I'm pretty certain Leinster will put out a team different to the team that they'll put out the following week against Saracens. So that while that Leinster side still beat Ulster a few weeks ago. Uh, it's very different when it's a final. So I think this game will be a lot closer than a lot of people think. And and this will also hugely depend on on the team that Leinster put out. We know pretty much who Ulster are going to put out because they just don't have the depth of Leinster. They can't put out two 15s like Leinster can. But Leinster could have a lot of changes in, in their starting 15s from, from the two weeks. And that might just give Ulster a little bit more um, hope, I think it'd be the best word to say. I guess Ian Madigan was the guy we were all speaking about after the match. Uh, took all the headlines and those five points were crucial that he kicked uh, when he came off the bench. Alan Quinlan was, was on with us yesterday and talking about how he, he never expected, as difficult a kick as it was at the very end, he never expected Ian Madigan to miss. He just has that swagger, that aura about him. Um, how impressed were you with Ian Madigan and the battle he showed towards the end? Uh, it's a nice story. You know, Ian's a really nice guy, good guy, you know, and he's a quality player. He's just had the problems of being behind a lot of quality 10s, uh, you know, being behind Johnny Sexton uh, in, in uh, Leinster and Ireland. You know, remember he kicked a pretty famous kick for uh, Ireland back in the in the uh, 2015 World Cup, you know, and, and he's been on the road just trying to get starts, trying to play his game. And uh, he's gone to Ulster, got a one-year deal, and uh, just the delight on his face, you knew what it meant to him. You know, he, he's... He's going to finish his career whenever it happens, knowing that he's given it every every shot. There's there's not much more that young man could do to 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 uh, show people he's got what it takes. And uh, I was really pleased for him. You know, there's certainly amongst the Leinster guys, uh, I know they speak so highly of him and and, uh, uh, and and rate him as a person. And 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 everyone's took some joy in seeing him kick that. And look, there was a lot of pressure on him. And uh, he's, he's shown in the past he can do it, and he stood up and did it again. And if you were Embra, if we, if we just flip it over, if you were Embra, you would be shattered. That's a game that's going to stick with them for a long time because they had that game won and buried and back on the bus three or four times. And somehow they'll still be looking today. They lost that game, and Ian Madigan had a lot to do with it. That conversion when he first came on, the one from the sideline, that's the thing that gave them the hope. And, and that was both of them were great kicks. But that one from the sideline was an absolute belter. Do you start him this weekend, Matt, and just you know let him go up against his old team and kind of try and ride that crest of a wave? It's an interesting one. Um, I, I always quote uh, Donald Lanahan said something to me once many years ago that I've never forgotten. Uh, big Donald's full of wisdom, and he, he we were talking about selections, and he said something to me. He just said, "Matt, the coach knows best." So. Dan McFarlane will know what's best to do to get the best out of that team. I, I can't see him dropping his captain. I can't see Burns not mm. starting. And Burns played very well. It's not like Burns. Burns himself, um, when he took that intercept, with a great piece of communication. I don't know if, the, if, if your listeners uh, remember, uh, it looked like a certain try for, um, for Edinburgh. And Burns was running back. And the the Ulster full, I think it was, I think it was Stockdale coming up. I just can't quite recall the defender. Burns pointed to him and said, "Take him." And so Stockdale went for the ball, and that allowed Burns to either cover back inside, but he took the intercept, which stopped the, which would look like a certain try because there was there was two two uh, support players there. So I, I suspect Burns will hold his position in that in that side, and he's had a very good year pre-COVID as well. But we'll certainly see Madigan late in the game, and and obviously. Uh, Cash McFarlane's going to have a lot of confidence in Madigan coming off the bench. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Felipe Contepomi was out 
doing the rounds and he's in the papers this morning from yesterday. He described Friday night's game as a box kick fest. He says he actually some, had some pretty interesting things to say about kicking in general. He said what we need to learn to take is not to get dragged into a game of contestable box kicks. There has to be more space. Is that one of the biggest things that Leinster can work on in the space of the, the eight days that they have now? Yeah, I think people will look at those tactics and, and there's two sides to the tactical equation. It stopped Leinster playing, but it also stopped Munster playing. Mm. And M Munster didn't, you know, the stats on on the ball getting to Conway and Earls, you know, two quality wingers. Uh, I think they got one pass each in the game and I believe Conway's, the stat with Conway's pass was behind him. He had to go back and retrieve it. So they, that, that didn't give themselves uh, an opportunity. Uh, and, and as a slight segue, it also showed how important Dev Toner is to Leinster. Of course, when Dev Leinster line-out struggled, they bring Dev back into that uh, line-out. He, he not only called brilliantly for Leinster, but Leinster stole or disrupted a lot of uh, Munster line-outs, so they couldn't launch their attack. And, and Munster, you know, I, I read what Coach Van Grand said, you know, if I was Munster, I'd be hugely frustrated. They didn't fire a shot in that game. And they, I think they got their tactics wrong. Leinster got frustrated, but I, the rain didn't help. But I would like Leinster, as Felipe said, and I know um, Felipe's philosophy on the game very well, there was lots of opportunities to counter-attack to get two and three passes into that game in, once they got the ball. And if Leinster can shift that ball, that's when they're at their best. You know, they bring their forward runners into the game. That's that's hugely important for Leinster. But they're counter-attacking and bringing in the... The, um, the skills and the power and pace and footwork of uh, Lama and, and, and the rest of that back line, James Lowe, from counter-attack. Uh, uh, Gary Ringrose in particular would be uh, lethal off that, and that's what happens. Your outside centre tends to be the one that gets the ball off a counter-attack on the two or three passes from the fullback or the wingers. And I think Leinster will, uh, will learn a lot from that. And the team's kick, they better have a good chasing line because if Leinster counter, they counter very well. Uh, Contepomi was also saying that the new breakdown laws are encouraging more caution, essentially, with ball in hand. Is that something you go along with? And uh, like, if that is the case, we probably have to be a little bit concerned about the product we're going to get over the next little while. Yeah, look, I'll, I'll take you back 10 years on, on to, to where the laws changed similarly and the referees constantly were penalising teams in possession for what they called sealing off it was in those times someone losing their feet coming in so your fullback would catch the ball you try and run and counter and you, the second supporting player would come in the referees were just pinging the offensive team unmercifully and it was horrid i, I was coaching also at the time and i hated it so all you could do was kick you had to kick back and and you, you're saying to the ref why are you doing this why are you doing this and they just become a little bit focused on one area. And I, I would agree with, with Felipe. Like, some of the, like, we're still getting lots of offsides. The defending teams are still offside a lot. But the referees are really going off their brain about the, where the players are entering on the attacking side. And we saw that in New Zealand when the rugby uh, uh, came back there. And I think around the world, everyone's kicked on with it, obviously from instructions from head office. But I would agree with Felipe that, that it, it gets to a point where you can't, run the ball and take a risk in your own half. Not because you're worried about dropping the ball, but because at the next ruck, you're very concerned the referee's going to penalise you and that's going to be three points. Mm. Uh, and and I, I think, you know, don't get me started on the needs for changing and, mm. and renewal in, in rugby and the legislate, legislators of the, games, of the game are so far behind the thinking of the coaches. Rugby has a huge, huge issue with the legislators being caught way, way behind. And this is, this is certainly an area... Um, and what, that, what the negative of that is, it, all of this penalises positivity. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you're saying that we're letting the defenders get up, they're not committing anyone to the ruck, but we're going to penalise guys at the ruck. So every bit of positive play you're trying to put about counter-attack and, and running the ball, you're, you're encountering this negativity that the laws are reinforcing. It's a big issue, and it's a difficult one and a highly complex one, but that still doesn't give our legislators at World Rugby the excuse to dodge it. And right now, I've got to say, I feel, um, there's probably some people at World Rugby who won't agree with me, but I feel they are dodging it. And they're not looking at this with the, the, um, the intellect and the urgency that it requires.
Right, that's interesting to be interesting to see how that develops over the next little while. Uh, Matt, before we let you go, before we let you go, we just wanted to get your take on Munster. You mentioned them there uh, a moment ago. It, it's like, is this? Are we at a situation here now where there has to be a serious review of the Johan Van Graan era? It, it, does there have to be a little bit looked into how to get the best even out of your coaching staff, let alone the players who actually take to the field? Where do you stand on those couple of questions? It's outside of one. Let, 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 let's, let's get in our helicopter and go up several thousand feet. And there are lots of teams around Europe that would give their right arm to be finishing in the semi-finals of their domestic uh, league and their Heineken Cup every year for 10 years. So finishing in the semi-finals is not a disgrace. Um, you, you know, if, if, you, we went, if we went to Ron, Ronan over in uh, La Rochelle, we said, listen, mate, we're gonna, would you take finishing in the semis of uh, the Pro 4, uh, the top uh, 14 and the, and the Heineken Cup? I'm pretty sure it'd Roger take your arm it's off. A better league, you know? though. So, yeah, well, it is a better league, but still, you, you, you know, we can't run down our own league. Mm. That's another problem. Let's, let's, that's not that's a separate issue. Um, look, and, and Munster went with a young coach. They went with Coach Van Graan, who's unproven as a head coach, and he's made his mistakes for sure, like we all do. Every one of us that, that steps into being a head coach, and I, I spoke to the, the late, great Axel Foley about this, you're going to make mistakes when you're the boss. That's the deal. That you, you just accept it and learn from them and go forward. But if they're going to go with a young coach, they've got to stick with him. And I, I got, take you back to Michael Checker, who had a number of lean years when he first got to Leinster. If he lost that semi at Croke Park against Munster, he was out the door. Mm. They win the semi, they win the Heineken Cup. Look what Michael's done for the rest of his career. Who'd be a coach? It's a mugs game. I can tell you, it's a mugs game. Uh, I, I think Coach Van Graham got everything, a lot of things wrong uh, last week. But should he be sacked? Should he be taken out? No. Should there be some guidance given to him? I, I'd like to think there would be. He's got two very experienced and smart guys in his staff. So I, I don't know what goes on within the, um, those four walls, but they all got it wrong because the tactics against Leinster, you're never going to beat Leinster like that. You're never, ever in 100 years going to beat them like that. And, and, and in some ways it gave Leinster a, an armchair ride. So that, they need some thinking. But that's not the time right now to uh, press the panic buttons. I, I think we want to see what they do in the upcoming season. And, and there's frustration. Look, I know, and I love winding up all my, all my Munster friends. I love winding them up, talking about the semis, you know. There was someone put out uh, the, the uh, Hello Darkness, my old friends, with the song <laughs> Sounds of Silence. And it was Hello Semis, my old friends, you know, to all the Munster <laughs> <laughs> to all the Munster people, which when you're from Leinster, you laugh. And Munster, I don't think they were laughing too much. But uh, look, look w w there, there is some thinking to do, but don't hit that red button just yet. For sure. And I think the main thing here is that we're not quite sure exactly what the dynamic is, but what we can do is maybe make an educated guess. Is your hunch that Stephen Larkham is, has got his proper fingerprint on that Munster attack on the evidence of last Friday? Uh, on the evidence of last Friday, Stephen Larkin will be hiding under his bed with a pillow over his head. I, know, I coached against Stephen for years and watched him coach um, for, for both the Wallabies and, and for the Brumbies. He is an attacking uh, coach. He, he runs the ball. That's his heritage. Same as me. That's his heritage. He's a runner of the ball. And I saw last year plenty of Stephen Larkin over that Munster side. They ran the ball really, really well at times last year. As I said on the show last week, some, you, you can see when they set up, Munster basically get the ball 15 metres infield. They have five or six guys on the short side. They have a pot of forwards out there and a chance to go out the back. And it's a great setup. It's a great setup. It gives all the players options. And if you had Joey Carberry there calling the shots, I'm sure things... I'm not, I'm not taking anyone from JJ Henry, but I think it's, it's designed for Joey. We didn't see any of that last week. It wasn't sighted off nobbies. So... Why that occurred last week, where those tactics came out, I don't know. Someone's rolled the dice. Obviously, he's got to sit at Coach Van Grant's feet. He's the boss, and it didn't work. So, um, you know, go figure. Next time they play Leinster, they've got to come up with a better plan than that because um, you, you, Leinster will eat you up with that every day. As I said before at the beginning, why Ulster have got a chance? Because Ulster will throw 100 punches. You're just not sure how many are going to land. Mm. Where last week... Munster didn't throw any. I mean, I can't imagine. I, I, I can imagine, actually. I can imagine what Alan Quinlan and, 
and uh, all that, all that gener- my generation of, of Munster players who are great guys and ultra competitive human beings and hated anything to do with the blue jersey. They must have just been sitting there last week throwing things at the TV. It was, uh, it, it was truly remarkable to watch, to, to see Munster getting it so wrong, so, so wrong. Matt, you mentioned who would be a coach and, uh, you know, questioning what, what went on <clears throat> within those four walls. But uh, there's been a little bit of analysis done uh, after uh, the weekend's defeat for Munster. People talking about Stephen Larkham and how maybe he uh, has a similar playing philosophy to Johan van Graan. As someone who has spent a lot of time in, in, in dressing rooms and dugouts, uh, how difficult can that be if there's a, a couple of coaches on a, on, a, on a backroom team that maybe have slightly different styles and philosophies over how the game should be played than, than the head coach? Hugely problematic. Hugely problematic. Uh, a coaching team, just that, is a team. And, and it should integrate like the wheels of, of cogs. So what, and I'll give you an example of, of some of the people I've worked with. I've worked with Alan Gaffney. Alan Gaffney was, is a great attack coach. His, his ideas on attack. So I let Alan run the attack. I ran the defence. They were great coach, forwards coach like Willie Anderson, great scrum coaches. You, you have to bring them in and they have to share a common philosophy and you, you have to choose very carefully um, because if you don't, you get clashes and you get, you get mismatches. And, you know, uh, Munster have gone with a South African uh, philosophy and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but it's a very, very different philosophy to what Stephen Larkham has been brought up with at the Brumbies. Uh, the way the Brumbies and, and ran the ball, their, their detailed planning on their attack, it's, it's totally different to the physicality and, and the, uh, the, the pure rush attack and defence that um, South Africans employ and have employed so well. Whereas Leinster have much more gone down uh, the Australian-New Zealand pathway. Uh, mm. so, so you can see that's different. Now, if you go to Leinster... Uh, Leo and Felipe and, and Emmy Farrell all, have all worn the jersey and all played together. Uh, now, I know you, you, you've got Stuart in there who, who's English, but the, the, the whole philosophy of, of that Leinster coaching group has been forged over 20 years. So they, they're very comfortable with each other. They've got to known each other, played together. They've known each other for a long, long time. So when Leo... No, wants Felipe back, he knows the sort of person he's going to get. He's going to get this passionate, hard-working, highly intelligent man, and he knows how Felipe runs because Leo played with him for so long. Emmett has been around the team for so long. Emmett played for me. He had a horrific injury to his knee. But Emmett's been around the team also for 20 years and played and wore the jersey and understands the basic philosophies of what of, of, and the DNA of Leinster. You then bring in someone like Stuart, who is superb at his skills and the development of the skills in the game and the decision making you've got a great group that doesn't mean Munster haven't got it but they've got to build it and grow it and that's what a good head coach is the difference between head coaching and assistant coaching head coach he's got to have a vision but he's got to mold and bring everyone with him and sometimes that's hard uh, depending on the group sometimes your group is given to you and you've got to make that's when it's it's even harder so if coach Van Graham has chosen Stephen Lark and that hasn't been chosen for him and Roundtree, then he should have known that those philosophies could be melded and joined together. That's what he would have... If, if he's just been thrust on him, which I don't know, I would hope it wouldn't have been, uh, then, then that's a different kettle of fish. But that's what makes head coaching so different. It's not just the tactics. It's not just the, the, the day-to-day. It's getting the culture of the players, the whole organisation, and getting the best out of your staff. You know, getting your staff to give you everything they've got. That's when you see... Great teams like like the, the the New Zealand national team, when uh, in the World Cup final when it was in New Zealand Eden Park, they scored a, a trick line out play against France, and the whole coaching staff uh, reached down to the forwards coach and smacked him on the back, you know, rubbed his hair, smacked him on the back. That's your try because you came up with it. You get joy out of each other's successes. You're not trying to keep it for your own. You, you, you get joy out of seeing the people you work with do well and things go great. So. And right now, I just don't see... I'm not seeing that at Munster. It doesn't mean it's not there. It doesn't mean there's, there's fighting or anything, but you're not seeing that cohesiveness that we, we're seeing at, uh, at Leinster, for sure. But they're still making semis. That's, yeah. this, is, this is not failure. And this is... They're not winning, and they're not getting trophies, 
but they're still making semis. You know, if, if they're not making semis and they're not making playoffs, yeah, okay, right out. That's a big problem, especially for a big club like Munster. But uh, I'm going to say one other thing in this uh, to finish off. I've been talking too much. It's not like me, Not it? at all. Uh, mate, you know, I'm gonna say, the Munster guys are trying their guts out. But if you pick a combined Munster Leinster side, there's not many Munster guys make it. Right now, Leinster have just got a really high quality group of players. And as players, they're, they're probably better than the Munster players. Now, I'm not saying anything against the Munster players, I'm not talking them down. That's just a reality. When, I, when you coach a great side, you walk out, we're going to beat this side by 40 points because your players are better. And other days, you know, you know, you stand there and you look at, wow, it's going to be a tough day because look, at, look who they've got in their team. They're going to kill us. And that usually happens. There's an old saying, coaches don't make players, players make coaches. And Munster just haven't got the high quality there at the moment compared to Saracens before they were uh, relegated and, and Leinster and probably Racing as well. Uh, you know, maybe maybe to lose in, in that mixture in Exeter. They just haven't got the quality of players. So sometimes a coach can't do anything about that. Uh, so it's a complex issue. It's not uh, it's not just a black and white one. Yeah, it certainly seems that way. Uh, Matt Williams, appreciate your time. Thanks a million for taking the call. Pleasure, guys. Lovely to talk to you.